So I do think that vaccines have become a, a victim of their own success. So the fact that you don't know anybody that had measles or died from measles or hospitalized with measles or hospitalized with chickenpox makes it much harder to make that that connection in people's minds that this is a dangerous disease because maybe measles is something that their grandmother talked about that everybody had and it wasn't something people were worried about. But that's not the case. And I do think that people have lost that appreciation for the power of infectious diseases and and it has gotten people complacent and they think, oh, it's not a big deal if I'm not vaccinated because these things are not very bad, but they don't remember that they were bad. And for example, measles last year killed 85,000 people around the world. It's still a major infectious disease threat. And influenza had record numbers of deaths in last season. And people had the lowest vaccination rate against influenza ever last season, which is not a surprise when you see the number of deaths. But so I do think that people have this idea that these are problems of the past that aren't going to have any implications in, for us in the future. And I think that we have that luxury in many developed countries where you, we have got these diseases under control, but they're only under control because of the vaccine. So it's a very strange paradox people have in, in their thinking about these things. Well, why don't we start off with you telling me where you're from? So I'm from Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania. I grew up in, in the Pittsburgh region. I was born in Philadelphia. And I'm primarily based in Pittsburgh, but I also do work in Baltimore as well as a little bit of stuff in, in New York City. But I'm primarily East Coast based and I've, I've been there my whole life. So you've been in Pittsburgh your whole life, born, raised there now? Well, I was born in Philadelphia, which is on the other side of the state, but I moved to the mm. Pittsburgh area around uh, the age of like two or so. And then I went to high school there. I went to college in Pittsburgh. I ended up being faculty at one of the, the universities there and I work at the medical centers there as well. So Pittsburgh is sort of my home and and probably will be for the foreseeable future of my, my home base, but I do travel a lot to the, throughout the East Coast. And what drew you to medicine? I liked all the detective work. Both of my parents are physicians, and it was something I was exposed to at a very young age, almost continually. And it was something in the back of my mind that I always wanted to do medicine. My parents weren't didn't push me one way or another. Actually, probably pushed me away from medicine because it had changed a lot uh, over the the last several decades. But I kept getting drawn back to it, and specific parts of it, the, all of the mystery and all of the way it integrates with other things that are going on in the world really was something that I found fascinating and really challenging and something that I really couldn't find anywhere else. So I worked a little bit doing finance and stuff when I first finished college, but I changed my mind pretty quickly and decided I wanted to go into medicine. And specifically, I wanted to focus on infectious disease because that's where I thought the the most challenging problems were, the most interesting topics were. And the part of medicine that really had this cascading effect everywhere into all fields uh, is really only found in infectious disease. Yeah, so what do you mean by that? Because you said you were drawn to it because it incorporated so many other fields. So when someone has an infection, uh, think about, you have to you have to say, how do they get this? Who are they in contact with? What what put them at risk for this? What the, what are the implications for this? And there are certain diseases, and one case would be a national worldwide emergency. So if somebody had smallpox today, one case would be a national security emergency for every country in the world. There, there's never been any kind of medical condition that's toppled empires or changed the courses of war. All of that's been infectious disease. So if you look at, for example, Napoleon's invasion of Russia, that likely failed because of an outbreak of typhus among his soldiers. Or if you look at the Black Death killing one third of the population of Europe and how it changed the whole structure there, where the whole feudal system broke down because they, the peasants basically revolted because there was uh, they had, there were so many more of them now and, and less structure to the society. Or you look at pandemic flu and it's in its the way the 1918 pandemic uh, came on the heels of World War One. All of these things are, are not something you'll see if you talk about a heart attack or cancer right, or high cholesterol. Right, because you have to talk about history, geography, migration, politics, I'm sure, right. yeah. all these all these areas. Yeah, and I don't think you'll find that any, it's, it's something that is not lost on infectious disease, but many people don't appreciate it from the outside because it's not just the same thing as being a, a radiologist or a dermatologist. This really has a a huge scope. And when you ask the general public to name a doctor, they're going to name somebody like, or name somebody from medicine, they're going to say something like Louis Pasteur or Jonas Salk. And it's not surprising that they're naming people from infectious diseases because mm. those are things that people have, have dealt with all, all, the, all throughout history. Whereas it's very hard to ask someone to name a famous cardiologist. Most people could not do it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So your actual spec uh, specific areas are infectious diseases, 
critical care medicine, emergency medicine. Is that right? Right. I, I knew I wanted to do infectious disease, but I didn't want to just be an infectious disease doctor. I was very interested in pandemics, disasters, emerging infectious diseases, and, and bioterrorism. And I thought that the best way to get that 360 degree view of this would be to have experience in emergency medicine, because that's where many of these infections present to. They don't just show up to an infectious disease doctor. They show up in emergency departments like we saw in 2014 with Dallas in the Ebola outbreak uh, that with the three cases that occurred in Dallas. They show up in an emergency department. And people get very sick and they end up in the intensive care unit. So there's a lot of cross um, I think cross-disciplinary work between infectious disease and critical care, because, for example, during a pandemic of influenza, there's going to be lots of people in the intensive care unit on mechanical ventilators. So having those skills, the emergency medicine skill set and the critical care skill set, gave me, I think, a unique way to look at infectious disease and approach infectious disease from a multidisciplinary standpoint that really, I think, helps me understand a problem in a way that many other people in the field can't because I can see where it's going to implicate other parts of the, the healthcare system and how other physician specialties are going to deal with this. And and there's lots of things that get promulgated down to emergency departments and ICU ICUs. And I think it's better to have that perspective coming from people who... So when I, when, when I say that an emergency department should be able to test for such and such a disease, I think it, it, it goes over better knowing the fact that I am an emergency medicine physician as well, that I work in an emergency department, so I understand the constraints and issues that happen there. And the same goes for the ICU. So I'm not some just infectious disease doctor pontificating without any understanding of how an emergency department works or how an ICU works. So do you work in emergency departments a, a lot and do you do that locally in your area or do you travel a lot wherever these are occurring what does kind of an everyday look like for you so the every day is a little bit different for me but i do work in emergency departments a couple times a month in in my in my local area and that's something i just do i just a regular I just as a regular part of my my work and i i do infectious diseases as well where i consult on cases at a, at a major medical center and then i also do critical care at a major medical center so i do those that's kind of my clinical part of my life which is about 50 percent of what i do and then the rest of it is i work at a think tank where i think about these these issues at a more broader scale and looking at the policy policy issues that are going on with infectious disease, or I spend a lot of time talking to the media about infectious disease, writing about infectious disease, and thinking about what the next big thing might be or, or how to prepare for it. Yeah, you have your blog. Right. Tracking Zebra. Right. Yeah. So I started a blog uh, several years ago because I wanted to, to have a way to talk about these things in a, in a kind of an uncensored manner where I could really just say what was uh, what I thought were the major issues going on. And I came up with the name Tracking Zebra because it's kind of a term of art in, in my field or in medicine in general. Uh, it comes from this idea when you're a medical student, anytime you see a case of whatever it might be, the medical student invariably will pick the most rare cause of what it could be. So you're all often admo admonished when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras, uh, because it's much more common to hear. To, to, what's common is common. But in my field and with infectious disease, I'm really worried about the zebras, things that are going to come from another part of the world or something that's never been seen before or something that changed. So I'm tracking zebras rather than tracking horses. You know, that's kind of where the, the blog comes from. And I use the blog to speak about these topics, to, to talk about some of the, the books that come out in the field and, and use it kind of as a centerpiece for what I'm trying to, to do. When did you start your blog? I started it around 2012 or so, and it's kind of gone gone through stages where sometimes I, I post a lot, sometimes I post less. I think after Ebola, because I was doing so much general traditional media, I got less likely to use it and was more likely to try and publish op-eds or, or speak to the media directly about it, but I still use it as a, as a tool. Mm -hmm. And who's your audience? My audience is anybody that's interested in science, so that could be people that are in my profession, that are that are physicians or, or, or scientists, as well as public health professionals, and the general public that has some interest in what's going on, because I do try to write at a level that's accessible to all, uh, to all different uh, people that might find some interest. So I will have the technical information there, as well as a way to think about it if you're not technically oriented towards some of these. And I often have actionable items there saying, this is what, these, are the, these are the three most important questions to think about with, with such and such or whatever's going on. So mm -hmm. I try to keep it at that level. On kind of a side note, where do you find the time to post so much? Because you, you blog probably, what, what, once a week? Uh, I, my blogs, my, my blogs used to be daily. They're they're in free, they're less frequent now. But I think most of my time is f focused on on Twitter, which I do spend a lot of time trying to keep abreast of everything that goes on. And I use Twitter more as a as a memory tool for myself because there's so much going on that 
if you if you just read the newspapers, you wouldn't actually see because it only only when it bubbles over to public panic mm-hmm. do you see it in the mm-hmm. general press uh, often. But I do. May I actually carve out time every day to make sure that I keep up to date with that. And I think it's not something I think of as separate from my career. I think it's part of what I want to do is keep up to date on these things. And I like to put this this stuff out on Twitter because there's so much uh, uh, so there's so much of an opportunity to amplify what you're saying there and get people thinking about these issues if you actually collate it and put it in a proper in the proper context. And, and that's what I, I I try to think of as a key key role that I'm playing in the field. Well, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is because you do such a good job of uh, taking these really complex topics of infectious diseases and pandemics, and you do a good job of breaking it down in layman's terms. So on that note, um, I want to I wanna ask you a little bit about just the general topic of what you do in the world of pandemics and infectious diseases. I mean, are you able to break down for us the different types of infectious diseases? Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's four types. Is that right? It depends on how you want to classify them. So in general, an infectious disease is a a disease caused by an infectious agent. And an infectious agent could be a bacteria, so something like E. coli, which we heard about recently with the romaine lettuce outbreak, a virus like HIV, uh, a fungus. uh, There's parasites, protozoa. There are prions, which are uh, which are infectious proteinaceous materials or proteins, like like what caused mad cow disease. Mm-hmm. So that, that's what one is, way. What is that? So that last one. Uh, it's a prion. So a prion is unlike anything that we've seen cause an infectious disease. It is actually a malformed protein that gets into your body and then sets off a cascade of malformation of other proteins like it and leads to diseases like mad cow disease. And they're very scary, very mysterious, and and very new to science. So there's tons of mystery with prions. And they are a rising issue because we have another prion disease in the United States, more in the Midwest, called chronic wasting disease, which is killing deer and elk. And there's a lot of concern Uh, whether this prion has the ability to jump into the human species. So there are active studies going on looking at people who butcher deer and elk and hunt deer and elk and eat deer and elk, uh, trying to see if there are any early signs of infection Mm -hmm. there. But prions are very interesting because they're so small, they're very hard to diagnose, they're very hard to deactivate, and there are no treatments for them. And that's why mad cow disease was such a scary issue when it appeared in the the late 1990s, early early 2000s in in England. Gotcha. Okay, so those... Right. Different classifications. Yeah, those are the infectious diseases. Yeah, that's like the etiologic agents or what causes the infection. And then there's other ways to break down infectious diseases, for example, communicable versus non-communicable. And this is something the general public gets gets wrong a lot because they think infectious means contagious. That doesn't necessarily mean contagious. So there's an infectious disease called tetanus. Everybody gets a tetanus shot every 10 years. That is an infection that you get, but it's not transmissible from person to person. So when you think about what can cause a pandemic or what's going to cause an epidemic, what's going to be very scary, it's going to have to be a trans- transmissible or contagious infectious disease, something like influenza, not something like tetanus. Now, what's the point of, because I remember uh, a while ago, I volunteered at a hospital and had to get a tetanus shot for that. I guess I assumed it was so I wouldn't spread it to anyone in the hospital. No, that's probably not not the case because tetanus can't be spread from person to person. You get tetanus from the environment. But in general, hospitals like to have all their employees as vaccinated as possible so that they're not get, they're not getting sick. And the tetanus shot also contains other things in it. So, for example, the tetanus shot that you get will likely contain uh, a vaccine against diphtheria, which is communicable, as well as uh, pertussis, which is which is uh, highly communicable. So often the tetanus shot is is coupled with other things. So that's why hospitals like to keep people immunized against tetanus. But remember, you're in a hospital, you might get a needle stick. There could be tetanus bacteria that you could get. You could mm. get cut in a hospital. So tetanus is something that people routinely get immunized against in all all walks of life. And what's the difference between pandemics, epidemics, and endemics? I'll be honest in saying I wasn't, I knew, I thought I knew what a pandemic mm-hmm. was, but I'm like, well, what's the difference between that and the others? Sure. So let's start with epidemics. So an epidemic just means an increase in number of cases. So for example, Los Angeles recently had an epidemic of hepatitis A cases among homeless populations. So it just went up above the normal range that you'd expect in any given year. And it was in a, in a geographically localized area. A pandemic means, so the word pan, the, the, the prefix pan means everything. So a pandemic affects multiple people all over the globe. So for example, in 2009, we had the H1N1 pandemic, which affected the globe. And an endemic disease is something that's always there. So the common cold is mm-hmm. endemic all over, or Lyme disease is, is endemic to Pennsylvania. 
The other thing that's important to remember is when you use the word pandemic, it has all these connotations. People think the end of the world. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything. Uh, it doesn't mean anything like that. Pandemic just means that there's an increase in number of cases all over the world, encompassing the world. It doesn't say anything about severity. And again, I go back to 2009 H1N1 flu pandemic. It wasn't a very severe pandemic, but it was a pandemic nonetheless. And you had the media saying, you know, this was kind of a dud, but it wasn't a dud. It was still a pandemic by any definition of the word. It's just that people have smuggled in that connotation that it has to be severe, people dying in the street to be called a pandemic. So that's an important thing to, to keep distinct in your mind, that severity doesn't have anything to do with whether something is a pandemic or an epidemic. Um, you were talking about in the beginning about how pandemics have shaped history. Are you able to talk about that a little bit more? Sure. So pandemics, because they are so all-encompassing and because many of them are very severe, have really left huge dents in the human population. So like, let's take, for example, the 1918 flu, which were just 100 years ago. If you look at human lifespan, it's going up, 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 and then a dip, and then goes like that. For, for the 1918 flus, it left a mark on lifespan wow. in the United States. So this is something that really has the, the ability to change the course of history. So in 1918, you had people in the prime of life dying. Uh, that really takes a toll on a society. And, and that's just one example. If you look at the Black Death, the pandemic that happened in Europe in the 19, in the, in the, in the 13, 1400s, one third of the population was killed. Of the, of Europe. Of, of Europe was killed. One third. Yes. That, and that, that changed to, that caused major societal disruption, major structural changes that, that have occurred. I think that that, when you look at those two things, those are, those are two good examples of how a pandemic changes things. And when we looked at 2014 in Ebola, it wasn't a pandemic, it was an epidemic in West Africa of Ebola. You had states almost topple because of that, uh, because th there was so much unrest, so much societal disruption going on. So when you have this an out of control infectious disease, it really breaks down many of the structures in society. And because infectious diseases, for the most part, don't know, don't have boundaries. They they don't care if so, what someone's socioeconomic impact, uh, uh, socio yeah, they don't have borders. Is. Right, they don't have borders between yeah. people. Anybody can be infected. It really creates a lot of issues. And people, when you're dealing with a contagious infectious disease, people have this element of fear. They're more they're scared. If so, anytime there's a natural disaster, most people's general thing is to try and help and figure out what's going on. But with an infectious disease outbreak, people's natural inclination is to run. Uh, and, and to stay away from other people. So there's a lot of factors that happen within it when you have an infectious disease emergency that really can, can shape the way a, a country or the world responds to, responds to that infection and what it leaves in its wake. The flu pandemic of, what would you say, 1918? Mm -hmm. How, how uh, impactful was that? How many people died? About uh, between 15 and 100 million. Wow. In one year. How many, so I always ask, this is a, a rhetorical thing I do sometimes, so how many people have died of HIV? I don't know. About 35 million over 30 but, years. Uh, but this is 50 to 100 in one year. In one year. Yeah, so that's a, very, that's a very different thing that we're talking about. We call these things global catastrophic biological events, something like the 1918 flu, very different than HIV, which has taken a, you know, a horrible toll on people. But it was over a long period of time. It was slow. So people had time to adjust to it, to think about it. But if you imagine 100 million people being dead in, in a year, that really is going to, to have a, a com completely outsized impact versus any other type of infectious disease event. So, do, do they have any numbers on how many people were affected by it? It's probably 5% or so of the, of the world was infected. It was just a, a, it's, a, it's something that... It's hard because there's a lot, not a lot of data there, but we know if you look back at the at the newspaper reports and and some of the medical reports that came out that this was something that really was a, a seismic event in terms of uh, in terms of how it impacted everybody. There were even shortages of coffins because there was nothing to do there because there was nowhere to bury these people. Bodies were just dumped uh, because there was nowhere to put them uh, after this. Uh, um, in the wake of this uh, pandemic. The other issue was that you had other industries like the insurance industry, the, that, the hospital industry, all of these people didn't know how to deal with the pandemic because there was huge cascading impact. So for example, you had people, life insurance companies having to pay out big, big premiums because of this. And it, it really had this cascading impact on many different fields that you really don't get with any other type of any other type of medical event. And I think that's something, again, that I keep coming back to with infectious diseases, is that they're so different than any other type of branch of medicine because of what it can do to other industries and other parts of life.
Is this what what you call GCBRs? A GCBR is something that we call. It, it's a it's a term that my colleagues and I at the think tank I work at, work at they we developed to try and classify the most extreme form of a pandemic, mm. one in which all the means a society has to combat it are outstripped. The private sector, governments, they can't respond to this, where it causes either huge loss of life and major societal disruptions. And the really only one that we've seen that... Oh, and what, that, does, what does GCBR stand for? Global Catastrophic Biologic Risk. Gotcha. Or, and the, yeah, and the only thing that we've ever seen do that really is 1918. That's the closest that we, that's the, the best thing to keep in mind because it happens quick, fast, it outstrips all resources and, and it really leads to major societal collapse. And I think when you think about 1918 and flu, we know that flu has this capacity to do it. So when you think about global catastrophic biological risks, influenza is always at the top of the list because it's done it before and we are probably not very prepared for flu in 2019 in the same way that we weren't very prepared in 1918. We're better, but there are still many unanswered questions regarding flu and how we'll respond to it and how to, to get better at, at, for example, making vaccines, antivirals, dealing with hospitals. Uh, all of that is are still open questions whether we'd be able to cope very well in 2019 with a pandemic that is on the scale of the 1918 pandemic. Well, what is it about certain diseases that are able to spread more than others? So each disease, each infectious disease has that's contagious has kind of a continuum of contagiousness. So there, we talked about diseases that aren't contagious at all, like to, like uh, tetanus, and then something like influenza, which is pretty contagious. And it all has to do with a couple different factors. So one is how are they spread? So a disease that's spread through the respiratory route, through coughing, sneezing, or breathing is going to be much more contagious than something that's spread through blood and body fluid. So the most contagious disease known to man is, is measles, and that's because measles is spread through the airborne route. So just by breathing, you can spread measles. So if I were to leave this room two hours later, the air would still be infectious. And that's something that's very advantageous for a virus to be able to spread to people, that it's in the air. When you think about other diseases that are spread, for example, through blood and body fluids like Ebola, they are contagious and you can spread them, but they're never going to reach that scale as, a, as an airborne or a respiratory spread virus. So when you think about what's, how are things contagious, it really has to do with how they're transmitted. And that's something anytime a new virus appears or a new bacterial infection, you think, how is it spreading between person to person? And if it's in the air, that becomes very, very dangerous compared to if it's only in blood and body fluids because you can intervene with the blood and body fluids. You tell people, mm. wear a condom, don't share needles if you're injecting drugs, wear gowns and gloves if you're cleaning up body waste from people. Uh, you can't do that about with breathing. It's very hard to get people to wear masks and, and they don't even work most of the time with some of the particles being so, so small. Or if something is spread, for example, through sewage, you can say, Let's clean. Let's do some sanitation type of stuff. Let's get people's drinking water cleaner. You can do that kind of stuff, but you cannot do that with an airborne uh, infection. And that's why those rise to the highest level of pandemic threat. And when you think of when you think about ranking these types of pathogens and types of what can cause a pandemic. And I imagine that some diseases probably don't show symptoms right away. Is that right? Right. Some diseases have long what we call incubation periods, and some diseases you are contagious during that incubation period. So in many studies and modeling studies looking at control of infectious diseases if a disease is contagious during its incubation period when you know you don't when you don't have any symptoms at all so you've not changed your behavior those are very very hard to control and a great example of that is influenza influenza you're contagious one day before symptoms so you can go mm. out and be around doing stuff and spreading the disease without even having any symptoms and the other thing is also some some diseases have very mild symptoms in certain individuals that don't change their activities of daily living because you're, they're going out and they're doing stuff, so they're spreading it, and maybe they're going to cause severe disease in somebody else. So those that whole spectrum of illness that you can get from an infection serves to spread spread many diseases, and especially the respiratory ones like flu and measles, where people can go out and do things. Well, and you've said that human activity can help enhance pandemic potential. Right. I, I, there's lots of ways to put that. So human activity, for example, just by by doing things that nobody has done before. So we talk about certain high-risk populations. So, for example, bushmeat hunters in Africa who are butchering primates for, for food. That can sometimes expose them to viruses that are more likely to be able to infect humans because primates and primates are humans are parts of, part of the primate group of animals. So that's one way that you can expose yourself. Or people working in in butcher shops. That that's one way to one one way to do it. 
Also, there's something completely different. This what I call kind of the return of the primitive, where they people who who don't get vaccines that actually helps spread pandemics, or who drink raw milk, uh, where where not which, which isn't pasteurized, that can spread infections as well. There are lots of things you can do that way. Then there is the intentional, you know, bioterrorism, where we've mm-hmm. seen people try to weaponize we- weaponize many viruses that can also cause uh, a problem as well. And then also some of those labs that are working on these things can can have accidents and things can spread out of a lab. So there's many ways that humans can enhance pandemic potential. And another good example is in 2003, we had the SARS outbreak in China, which was basically covered up by the Chinese government, allowed to fester and spread before it actually came to notice and basically circled the globe, uh, caused 8,000 cases and with about a 10% mortality rate and and led to about $34 billion in economic losses with empty airports all over the world. How can you can you tell me more about that? I actually don't. I know SARS. I remember <clears throat> hearing the headlines or seeing the headlines, but I don't know if I knew the details very much. So SARS is a, a virus. It's a part of a group called coronaviruses, and for the most part, they'd only been characterized as causing the common cold. And what happened in in China was a special a special virus, a, the SARS virus, basically spread from bats into other animals. And one of the animals was called the civet cat. And this civet cat was a delicacy, uh, and people were eating it. And certain people ate it and got this new virus. And the virus was a common cold type of virus, so it spread through the air. And certain individuals that got infected were disproportionate spreaders of the virus, kind of like typhoid Marys. And that allowed this virus to really explode in certain in certain pl- parts of the world. And in China, when these cases first occurred, the Chinese government was very reticent to let anybody know about this. This, this tends to be a theme with infectious diseases, that countries don't want to say that this is mm. going on in their country. So it was covered up, and eventually it actually got leaked through kind of an email listserv that this was going on. And by, but by that time, it was too late because some of those people that got infected had gone to conferences, had gone to meetings. Uh, famously, a, a doctor had went, had went to Hong Kong to a medical conference and then infected other doctors who then spread all, oh, all over. Yeah. And we had cases in, um, in Canada. We had the, the city of Toronto really under siege with SARS. And thankfully, it only had a 10% mortality rate. And we figured out what to do to stop it, which was really better infection control in hospitals because it was exploiting healthcare facilities where people might be getting oxygen, might be getting certain drugs um, nebulized down there, what will be the asthma type of drugs that were kind of being aerosolized down that was spreading the virus all over. After we figured out that was the issue and stopped it and then stopped people from eating the palm civet cat, that, that outbreak basically was over. But that really was one of the examples in the modern world of what a, a respiratory virus could do. Because $34 billion of, of econo- economic losses is not small. And you had major disruptions uh, with, with travel. And there are pictures of airports that were completely barren because people were afraid to fly because of this virus being present. So how much of a threat are infectious diseases to us today compared to in the past? Well, in many ways, we've gotten better at handling infectious diseases, but they still remain a threat. So we do have antiviral therapies. We've got uh, a whole slew of vaccines. We've got much better sanitation, much better understanding of the transmission of infectious diseases. And back in 1918, they didn't even know that flu was caused by a virus. So all of that is going for us. We've got sophisticated critical care in hospitals where you can get mechanical mechanical ventilators, oxygen therapy, all of that type of stuff is very new. And it makes us much more resilient against infectious diseases. But they still remain a threat because we've seen that they there are lots of mysteries there. We have an HIV pandemic that's ongoing right now. We've got hepatitis C cases that are that are out of control, uh, plague, uh, kind of fueled by the injection drug use uh, rise in the United States. We have. Uh, bird flu viruses that are a uh, subtype of flu viruses that are very lethal, that are hard to control, and we don't have good vaccines for. We have a whole host of things that kind of come out of nowhere, what we call emerging infectious diseases, for which we don't have vaccines or antivirals for. So, And then we have antimicrobial resistance, so bacteria that become resistant to antibiotics that also pose a major threat. So there are definitely threats. I think the threat is much less than it was in the earlier time of our species, but it still exists. And in many ways, there are certain factors that might make it easier. So if you think about megacities and the population of the world, mm-hmm. how easy it is to travel from one side of the globe to the other before an infection spread at the, the speed of a boat, maybe. But now, it's, now an infection s- spreads at the speed of a jet. So you can be from one side of the world to the other side of the world very, very quickly. And what's happening in Africa can be in Los Angeles in a day. So it's not something that you can take lightly, the, the ability of, of humans to travel around the the world very quickly, and what that means for infectious diseases and disease importations and exportations. So so what can we 
what can the general population be doing on a daily basis to help prevent spreading or even catching infectious diseases? I think the number one thing that the general public can do is be vaccinated against what, what the known threats are. And then the other is to be on the lookout for odd things that happen and be care be mindful when you're doing things that put you at risk for, for uh, getting uh, kind of an emerging infectious disease. So if you are somebody that goes spelunking in, in caves and around bats, mm-hmm. for example, or if you're somebody who works on a farm or if you're somebody who, who works in a slaughterhouse or does, th- does things that expose them to other pathogens, it's important to know that and tell your doctors when you get sick hey, I work and, and I do this, because many times they don't do that. They forget, they don't think it's relevant uh, to even tell people that they've traveled somewhere where there might have been an infection. And I think that's that's something that people can do on a, on a day-to-day basis that will make us a little bit better. It's not going to completely do it because it's kind of part of the human condition that we're going to be bombarded by infectious threats. Because you have to remember that if you look at this planet from a biomass perspective, like the things that are alive on this planet, most of it is microorganisms, just a small, small sliver of that are are animals, and a small, small sliver of that are humans. So this planet is dominated by bacteria and viruses and lots of other things, fungi. If you look even in this room, you know, there's there's people in this room, but we're we're dwarfed by the number of bacteria that are in this room. Yeah, you said, you said, uh, look out for things that are odd. Yeah, so if if you if people have a, unexplained illnesses, that type of thing, don't let these things linger. Don't wait f- five days to come into the hospital and, and be kind of proactive about your own health. I think that's one way to do it, but it's going to be very hard to, to do that for the general public because it's, they're not going to know what's odd. But in general, when you look at cases that get missed, there often are, are warning signals or something that was off that people were, were ignoring or not quite uh, taking into full consideration. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask you about some some current topics that are happening in this space. We've already touched on them a little bit, but I'd love to go in more in depth. Um, the anti-vaccine movement. Mm-hmm. How did the anti-vaccine movement get started? So the anti-vaccine movement actually began with the first vaccine, and the first vaccine was against smallpox in the late 1700s. At that time, when Edward Jenner introduced this vaccine, the anti-vaccine movement basically was born. They thought because this this was a vaccine that was taken from what came from material from cows and was injected into humans, it posed a huge danger. There were cartoons in the in the papers in in the United Kingdom at that time, thinking about saying that people were going to grow cow parts, and the whole term conscientious objector that you talk about with war actually comes from the anti-vaccine movement because there are people who objected to being vaccinated uh, against smallpox. So it began then. And then it really kind of has always kind of festered along for a while, but it really took a more virulent turn, I think, in the 1980s or so with some groups in the United States that started blaming this one vaccine against diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus, the DPT vaccine, for causing these neurologic conditions, which were ultimately found to be caused by a, uh, by a genetic deficiency, but it smeared the whole vaccine industry and smeared vaccines, and people started to get galvanized against vaccines. And then it comes and goes for a while. And then in, 19, in the 1990s, there was a, a fraudulent paper that was published linking the measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMR vaccine, to autism in England by uh, by a group uh, there led by a man named Andrew Wakefield, who became kind of a uh, an icon in the anti-vaccine movement. And that paper, which was fraudulent, has been withdrawn. Uh, this person lost their medical license in England. Uh, that paper became viral in its own sense, no pun intended, and has taken off. And people have still, to this day, been wedded to this, what I think is now an arbitrary uh, association between autism and the MMR vaccine. And since that time, it's gotten into celebrity circles where you have individuals like Jenny McCarthy, Jim Carrey, RFK Jr., lots of, a a whole host of people uh, expressing skepticism about vaccines. And it's become something that has caused people to lose confidence in vaccines and has caused pockets of our country in the United States and also in the world to have levels of immunity against certain infectious diseases, such as measles, that are very contagious, fall below a level that gives us protection. And so it's not surprising that we have measles outbreaks in Washington state, for example, uh, currently, because this this anti-vaccine movement and this vaccine hesitancy has become such a, a major issue that it actually risks the return of many of these infectious diseases. And I think that the fact that it's into, in celebrity culture makes it even worse because we don't have great advocates for vaccines other than doctors and nobody, it's very hard to, to, to break through uh, to the general public when when you have so much 
on the anti-vaccine side coming at you from social media and from celebrities. I often ask people to name a pro-vaccine celebrity, and most of them cannot. I mean, there are some, but but they but they're not on the tip of the tongue the way the anti-vaccine uh, the anti-vaccine movement has its own spokespeople. Yeah, I mean, because I guess that's very true in that I guess people can't be. Um aren't necessarily going to be fanatics for something that they don't necessarily see the effects of. So, you know, if, if pe people take vaccines and therefore are, um, you know, uh, are prevented from getting certain diseases, well, they, they was prevented. It wasn't like they had something and then it was cured. Right. So I do think that vaccines have become a, a victim of their own success. So the fact that you don't know anybody that had measles or died from measles or were hospitalized with measles or hospitalized with chicken pox makes it much harder to make that that connection in people's minds that this is a dangerous disease because maybe measles is something that their grandmother talked about that everybody had and it wasn't something people were worried about. But that's not the case. And I do think that people have lost that appreciation for the power of infectious diseases and and it has gotten people complacent and they think, oh, it's not a big deal if I'm not vaccinated because these things are not very bad, but they don't remember that they were bad. And for example, measles last year killed 85,000 people around the world. It's still a major infectious disease threat. And influenza had record numbers of deaths in last season. And people had the lowest vaccination rate against influenza ever last season, which is not a surprise when you see the number of deaths. But so I do think that people have this idea that these are problems of the past that aren't going to have any implications in, for us in the future. And I think that we have that luxury in many developed countries where you, we have got these diseases under control, but they're only under control because of the vaccine. So it's a very strange paradox people have in, in their thinking about these things. But, but it, what we see with Washington State or in New York and New Jersey where we've had big measles outbreaks or even the Disneyland mm -hmm. outbreak in 2014 is one in, one in five people got hospitalized during the Disneyland outbreak. That's not a benign thing for a child to be hospitalized. What do you mean one in five people? One in five people. From, so the Disneyland outbreak in 2014 was one of the more notable measles outbreaks we've had. And one, of, one in five of the children infected with measles during that outbreak ended up in the hospital. So it's not a benign illness if 20% of the cases are getting hospitalized. Do you know what the number is between, with all these measles outbreaks, all the children that have been infected with it, how many of them were not vaccinated versus those who were? The vast, vast majority of the cases of measles are are not vaccinated. And, and that's been shown in every outbreak. It is the, the leading cause of these outbreaks. It's the, the measles vaccine series, when you get the both two, sh two shots of them, it will give you about 97% protection. So it's very rare to see breakthroughs uh, in in cases uh, people who've been vaccinated. Although you do see some, it's the vast majority are driven by uh, by the unvaccinated population. And remember that there are people that are too young to be vaccinated. We give our first measles shot around 12 to 15 months. So there is that group that are less than 12 to 15 months who have no immunity. So they're always going to be uh, part of the highest risk group for measles. For the children who have been vaccinated, what is their risk of being infected if they're exposed to it? I know you said it has about a 97% success rate, but I'm, I'm thinking about kids who are, say, they're playing with kids who have measles. Hopefully it would be very, very low. Because I think that 97%, so they should be 97% protective. So there it's are, pretty strong. It's pretty strong. And I think that's that really attests to the fact that we were able to control measles because it was so strong, because we had such a good vaccine that worked, that we got measles down to record low levels. It, actually, it was actually eliminated from North and South America, eliminated from the Americas. It's no longer really eliminated because we've had ongoing transmission in Venezuela. But that's why the measles is gone. It's because of the vaccine. It's one of the most contagious diseases we know, and it was tamed only by a vaccine. Are you able to, since we're talking about measles, are you able to talk about the symptoms of measles? Because I think because I didn't grow up knowing anyone with measles, I didn't think it was an issue anymore. I don't think I really saw my first picture until very recently when I saw one of, one of these kids that was infected, and it looks really intense. Yeah, so sure. Measles is a is a respiratory disease. It's spread through the respiratory route. And most of the, the cases will begin with a cough, runny nose, red eyes, and then they develop that rash, which is characteristic. And that's yeah. the, the garden variety case of measles. But about uh, a small percentage of the patients that can get measles can end up with brain infection. So about one in 1,000 will end up having a, an infection of the brain, which can be dis disabling and life-threatening. A higher proportion of them, about about 20% or so, can get pneumonia, 
which means that the, the virus has infected their lungs and that can interfere with their breathing. And then about one in 1,000 will die from measles. So this is something that has a continuum of, of uh, symptoms from the respiratory and the rash to brain infection, pneumonia, death. Do you think there should be legislation mandating parents to vaccinate their children? So this is a hard problem that we're dealing with right now. And I, th I do think that the best way, at least in my mind, to think about this is that what, <clears throat> what the legislation, when you talk about legislation, most of this has to do with the fact that governments are running the schools, the majority of the, of the public school system. So I do believe that schools have the right to set their entry requirement. And I usually leave it at that. And the fact that there's that, that the government is the one, that the state governments are the ones that run these school districts, they need to run them properly. And I think as part of running them properly, they have to set entry requirements. And I do think for many infectious diseases that are vaccine preventable, having a school entry requirement, and, and measles is definitely included in that group, makes a lot of sense. And I think that it, it was, it's something that you don't want to have kids who, you don't want to have ki kids exposed to, so you might want not want to vaccinate your child, but you don't want to have that your child then exposing other children and putting them at risk. And you have to remember that the first dose of measles is at 12 to 15 months. Uh, the second one is around five years. So there's going to be people who are not fully immunized in the school just by a matter of when you give those vaccines. So it's not like, oh, you can vaccinate your child and I cannot vaccinate mine and yours. And if, you, if you're worried, just make sure your child is vaccinated, that you, you do that. But there's gonna be gaps because of the fact that it's a two shot series and that there are people who are going to be in the middle of their two shots that are at school, and there's going to be people who are unable to get vaccinated. So the measles vaccine is a live vaccine, so individuals with certain immune deficiencies will not be able to be vaccinated, or people who have cancers and are getting certain chemotherapies will not be able to be vaccinated. So there's going to be a group that are not vaccinated because of medical conditions, and some that are not going to be vaccinated by timing. And you have an individual coming into that school that's not vaccinated, they can then spread it to those individuals and you don't have the right to expose other people to potentially serious infectious diseases and schools have a right to be able to say we want we want our, they have, schools can tell you you can't bring peanut butter to school or peanut butter mm -hmm. peanut butter and jelly that's sandwich. right that's i yeah. just recently heard about yeah so if you can't bring a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to school but you're allowed to bring measles to school i think something is wrong and they're doing that to try and prevent the kids that might have peanut allergies. Right. Okay. So they're much more worried about peanut allergies than they are about measles. So you can bring measles and you can bring chicken pox to our school, but leave your peanut butter and jelly sandwich at home. I mean, that really makes no sense to me. I think schools should be able to set that requirement. And the fact that governments run schools, I don't think is an excuse um, for that, because I think that people always say this is big government doing that, but it's the, it's the government acting as the steward of those schools. And so long as we have public schools, you're going to have certain requirements that you for for what your entry requirements should be, and, and college private colleges do this too. They have certain vaccination policies as well, and you don't see people up in arms as much about that. That you know such and such university requires meningitis vaccination for their students. That's something that's very common, and I think you have to think of it that way. Or if you work at a hospital, you have to be vaccinated against flu or hepatitis B. All of that stuff is the same. You have to think of it the same way. But people have kind of moved it out of that fact. We aren't asking people to be vaccinated as a condition of living. It's not like you are born and you have to have these shots. This is if you want to go to these schools, these schools have certain entry requirements, which vary state by state, and one of them is certain vaccines. Is there anyone in the medical uh, industry that that is anti-vaccine that speaks uh, against vaccines? Are there any doctors or physicians? Oh, there are there are lots of doctors that speak against vaccines, uh, especially here here we're in California. There, California has been known for that. For example, California has one of the more stricter vaccine laws in the country, and now you've got this cottage industry of physicians selling medical exemption certificates. Uh, and there's been some academic papers about this where they looked at after the new legislation passed in the wake of the Disneyland outbreak in 2014, that now there are people that are getting fraudulent medical exemption certificates and they're getting signed by physicians. So there are physicians that are aiding and abetting the anti-vaccine movement. Oh, I see. So you can't, you have to get a certificate of exemption to not vaccinate your children. Right. Gotcha. In the three states, California, West Virginia, and Mississippi, they have the strictest vaccine entry requirements for schools, and you do need these medical exemption forms. Other states have these philosophical and religious exemptions, which are kind of ways that you can get out of vaccinating very, very easily, depending on the state. But in these three states, you have to have a, you know, a pretty strict medical exemption form to say that you have a medical condition that prevents you from being vaccinated, and you still should be allowed to go to school without that vaccine. But we're seeing fraudulent certificates being issued in California. And why do you say fraudulent? 
because the, the number went up substantially after the, the law. So many of these are not true contraindications or reasons that you can't get the vaccine. And if you look at what what happened after the philosophical and religious exemptions were were eliminated, what you saw was people moving from that way of not getting vaccines into the medical route. So there are people who are just the reasons are not, there's only very few reasons why you shouldn't be getting vaccinated, that you're immunosuppressed, that you've got an allergy to the components of the MMR vaccine, or that you had, or, or that you are, are on cancer chemotherapy. That, those are really three of the big ones that, that, that are there. But they don't amount for they don't account for how many exemptions that you're seeing and the fact that they increased only after the philosophical and religious exemptions mm-hmm. went up tells you that there is something going on and there have been ads of doctors in in this this paper that was published in an academic journal they had cited the presence of advertisements from doctors saying we get issue medical exemptions i mean doctors shouldn't be advertising that's kind of a little bit suspect on its face that that a doctor's advertising come to my office to get your medical exemption for a vaccination and you say that reli- uh, religious exemptions is no longer allowed? Not in California, oh, okay. not in Mississippi, not in West Virginia, but in many states they are. What what religions? I guess none, aren't. none. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> none. I don't think that there's any evidence that any any uh, religion has a, a real exemption against um, vaccination, especially against certain diseases. However, they, they are there are sects and groups that will use religion as an excuse to not get their vaccine. Mm. Uh, there are Christian scientists who kind of issue most of modern medicine. There are certain populations like the Amish or the that, that have traditionally had lower vaccine uptake and made it part of their religion or their cultural belief. Uh, however, I don't think anything is ironclad saying that you cannot be vaccinated. And there's lots of misinformation that's spread, that there's pork products in vaccines, so that maybe the people who are uh, a Muslim faith don't want to get vaccinated, but most of that has been debunked, and it's not really the case. And often you find the religious loophole is just a, a way to circumvent the school vaccine entry requirement. And I know it's different for every vaccine, but but what are in vaccines? Because I know that there's a element of the disease in it, right? Right. So to, to, for a vaccine to work, what it, what it does is it trains your immune system to recognize part of whatever you're vaccinating against. So if it's the the whooping cough bacteria or the flu virus or or the the measles virus that's inside some something is in that it contained in that vaccine so that when it's injected into your body that your immune system sees it and forms a response against it so then when it sees the real thing mm. it's able to quickly run into go into action and stop the real infection from occurring so that could be proteins from a virus it could be a deactivated form of the virus um, we're even getting now to the point where there's just genes of the virus that are being put into into vaccines so so i think that it depends on which individual vaccine that you're talking about so for the flu vaccine it's parts of a va- it's parts of the virus for the the measles measles vaccine it's a it's an what we call an attenuated strain or a strain that's been weakened that's in the in the vaccine and for other things for example um like the um the pneumonia uh, one of the pneumonia vaccines it's just protein parts of the pro just little pieces of protein from the the target that you're trying to vaccinate again so it all depends on the vaccine but the general principle is the same it's trying to train your immune system to see this as uh, a way to to develop a response against the real thing when it's faced with it later in time. Um, so, on the topic of vaccines, this makes me think of one of the most common ones, which we've been we've been touching on a lot, which is you know the flu and the flu shot. Um, I mean, you've already mentioned that you think it's still um, a threat, still something to be worried about. Right. So, flu is probably the highest on people's list, and one of the reasons is the vaccine. Although I recommend the vaccine to everybody, and it's the best way we have of preventing uh, flu and we see that it, it definitely prevents deaths and hospitalizations and pneumonia, it's not the best at preventing the flu in general. So people, lots of people who get the flu vaccine will have breakthrough infections. It's only about 40 to 60% effective at preventing the flu. And the reason is, is that we still make flu vaccines the same way we did in the 1940s, that the technology hasn't really been brought to bear on the flu vaccine. And the flu vaccine is something that we have to continually update every year looking at the strains we don't have anything close to what's called a universal flu vaccine so you get a measles vaccine 
that covers all the measles strains that are out there. There's no such thing for that with the flu vaccine. It's kind of the holy grail in the field is to make a vaccine that you get once or maybe maybe a couple times and that's it because it protects against all the strains. And until we have that type of a vaccine against the flu, flu will always remain a threat because it's always out there circulating. Flu lives naturally in bird populations and it's always out there. Many different strains that are in birds that are constantly finding ways to get into, into humans and we have no means to stop them because we don't have very good vaccine technology against flu. So that's become a major priority basically since the last, uh, since around 2005 to try and get a better flu vaccine that looks a lot like our other vaccines. It has durable immunity that you don't need to keep updating, that there's not this guessing game trying to figure out which strains to put in it. That, that whole thing needs to be fixed in order to take flu off the table as a pandemic threat. And you're saying right now, the flu shots that we have right now, you say they're about 40 to 60% successful at Preventing the flu, but it's important to remember that even if you get the flu, despite your flu shot, the flu you get will be less likely to be severe, less likely to have you go to the hospital, less likely to cause pneumonia, less likely to cause death. So that there are this, there's this cascading benefit of the flu vaccine that's often underappreciated because people always say, oh, I got the flu shot last year and I got the flu, but they don't realize that the flu they got was likely weakened compared to what they would have gotten without the vaccine. And how long are the, are the uh, side effects? The side effects of the flu shot are very mild. It's usually just a little bit of injection soreness, maybe some fever and aches for about a day or two. And it's not very, it's not very. So um, just a day or two. Yeah. About. What other um, vaccines do you recommend, like say uh, adults? I mean, obviously children have their recommended Mm -hmm. list for schools. What do you think about for adults? So it all depends on their risk factor. So for adults, I think that people should get their flu shot every year. They should get their tetanus updated every 10 years or so, a little bit shorter if they've got a bad wound. Uh, There are certain vaccines that we give with age. So these pneumonia vaccines, there's one called Prevnar, one called Pneumovax that we give it starting at age around 65 or so, depending upon a person's risk factors. There is a shingles vaccine that we give individuals as well. Shingles can be a very debilitating disease. And that's kind of the majority of the, the adult vaccines that that are there. And then there's also vaccines you give to people who travel. So for example, if you go to a part of the world where yellow fever is prevalent, you might get a yellow fever vaccine. Or malaria, I think of. Well, well, there's no vaccine for oh. malaria, but yeah, you take pills to take, you get, there's mm. pr- prophylactic pills that you take when you go into a malarious area. Uh, so yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, all of these types of things that you recommend. And there's certain occupational diseases that we give people vaccines for. So the military gets vaccinated against smallpox and anthrax. and uh, Veterinarians get vaccinated against the rabi- against rabies with the rabies vaccine. So it all depends on the risk factors. But in general, flu, tetanus, uh, shingles, and the, and the pneumonia vaccines are the ones that are the mainstay of adult vaccination. Speaking of pneumonia, is it just me or ha- have there been more... Is are pneumonia deaths on the rise? It might just be me, but I feel like I've, I've known a couple people the last couple of years that have passed away from pneumonia when I never knew anyone before. So pneumonia is still one of the leading. It's the only. If you look at the leading causes of death in the United States, it's the only infectious cause of leading of, of death. So pneumonia is something that's incredibly common uh, as a cause of death. I don't think that they've gone up uh, over the years, but it is still a major cause of death from an infection in, in the adults. And it used to be called, you know, one of the, the old man's friend they used to call pneumonia because it was something that people often succumb to with old age because maybe they can't clear their secretions, they get pneumonia, or they end up in a in a hospital on a ventilator and they get a ventilator-associated pneumonia. So pneumonia has lots of different ways of, of, of occurring, but it is something that has traditionally been associated with, with death in the elderly. Uh, how, how can you get pneumonia? I've heard things like, you know, don't go outside with your hair wet. <laughs> I don't know if no. that's... <laughs> no, pneum- yeah, pneumonia can be caused by a variety of things. So it's just like any infectious disease. Pneumonia can be caused by bacteria. It can be caused by a virus. It can be caused by fungus. Oh, so you can get it. Yeah. Lots of ways. Yeah. So most people do... When you talk about bacterial pneumonia, I think what most people are talking about when they gen- generically use the word pneumonia. And you have to remember that you've got lots of bacteria that live in your mouth and your nose. And some of those find their way into your lungs, especially if you're debilitated, have another lung disease, you're a smoker. And what ends up happening is that sets up an infection in your lungs, which leads to inflammation and an inability to get the oxygen out, get the oxygen into your blood from your lungs, and then people become short of breath. That's how that's how pneumonia occurs. And, and, and how long can that live in you when you have it? It de- it depends. So pneumonia can. Uh, there's always going. There's no such thing as a sterile site in your body. So there's lots of bacteria even in your lungs now as we speak. But pneumonia needs to be treated usually with an, a course of antibiotics, like five to seven days of antibiotics to actually stop that process from occurring when you're talking about bacterial pneumonia. If pneumonia is left untreated, that pneumonia can get worse. It can encompass all of your lungs. 
put you into respiratory failure. It can spread into your bloodstream and cause a really severe in infection. So that's why pneumonia remains a, a leading cause of death. Is that something that people can tell right away? Like if you go to a doctor or, or, or is it something you see symptoms of right away? Right, you, you do. So pneumonia, you can see, you can see fe fevers, chills, body aches, shortness of breath, cough, maybe you're bringing something up with you cough. Those are all signs and symptoms of pneumonia. And then a doctor's office, they may listen to your lungs and listen for abnormal sounds with the stethoscope. That's one way to diagnose it. And then definitive diagnosis is usually done by a, a chest x-ray or a chest CT scan to actually l image the lungs and see if there's a patch of abnormality there that's consistent with pneumonia. Gotcha. Gotcha. So is w what can you tell us about over sanitizing. Is there such a thing? So this is something that's become more of an issue lately because people have become obsessed with alcohol-based hand sanitizers, antibiotic hand sanitizers, and trying to keep everything very clean. And I think it's important to go back to something I said earlier, is that this planet is dominated by microorganisms. Our own bodies are covered with microorganisms. There's more bacterial cells on and in our body than there are human cells. So nothing can ever be sterile. And 99.9% .9 of all bacteria, viruses that are in the environment, on our bodies, do no harm, pose no harm, will never ha cause any problem. So it really is misplaced to try and sterilize everything. And the fact is, when you do this ster over sterilization, when you start to get people in the, raise people in these very clean environments, there is something called the hygiene hypothesis, where the more clean someone's childhood is, the more likely they are to develop autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, uh, allergic diseases like asthma, and even things like peanut allergy, which we alluded to earlier, all are much more likely probably to occur in people who are not exposed to so much dirt, dirtiness when they're a child. So I do think that this makes a lot of it makes a lot of biological plausibility that our over sanitation is leading to certain diseases because it's interfering with the good bacteria that live on and in us and do many different things for us. So I do think that over sanitation is a major concern. And so if a, you know a mother drops the baby's binky on the floor, they should probably just let the baby eat the, have the binky again and not worry about over sterilizing sterilizing things because I think that it becomes compulsive and it really ends up being more harmful than it is good. And it's actually just feeding a psychological need, not an actual physiologic one. Well, well, I hear that joke where they say, you know, with the first kid, parents are very, uh, they're very careful. They, that was the example, you know, if a pacifier falls on the floor, pick it up, they sanitize it, wash it, you know, dry it, make sure it's perfect. The second kid falls on the floor, they just rinse it off. And then the third kid, they just put it back in the kid's mouth. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that, that, yeah, that's definitely a phenomenon that you see that people get much more much more uh, worried about their first child than the other ones with this type <laughs> of things. But it's all misplaced. And I do think that, you know, soap and water to wash your hands is probably fine for most people. And, you know, we know that the even the um, antibiotics that are in toothpaste, for example, are causing problems uh, outside of that with, with antibiotic resistance. And there's lots of overuse of antibiotics and over-concern with sanitation that the sanitization that really has no basis in fact. Yeah, because that begs the question is what is too much? How do people know what's too much? It's hard for the general public to know, but in general, almost all of it is too much. You have to, if you keep in mind that there's bacteria all over you, that nothing is sterile, that you spend so much time cleaning your plates and everything, mm. it's not, it's, the second you put it back down, it's going to get covered again with bacteria. So there's, we live and, and we thrive in an environment full of bacteria, and most of them are not going to cause a problem. So I think most of it, unless something is visibly soiled, or obviously if you're doing something that where you're exposed to raw sewage or something like that, those types of scenarios are different and, and merit sanitation. But for everyday living, most of the time it's not that big of a deal. You say, as in terms of just like our, you know, your hands, soap and water, you think is yeah. Important. And I do think during respiratory season it's important that so during flu season when you're out in public places to wash your hands, try to avoid touching your face with your hands if you can. But it's not something that people should become compulsive over. And I think it's something that's kind of, it's unavoidable that you're going to be exposed to germs. And I think it makes no sense. You know, there's lots of articles that show up, you know, what's the dirtiest part of your kitchen? What's the dirtiest part of your bathroom? It doesn't really matter uh, in the end mm -hmm. because the whole planet is full of bacteria, viruses, fungi that really dominate the, the, dominate the entire uh, ecosystem of the world. You, I know you discussed the threat of bioterrorism as well. Can you talk about that? Sure. So bioterrorism is something that people really got wind of in 2001 with the anthrax attacks, but it's something that's been around for a long, long time, even going back into the, into like 600 BC or so, where people were poisoning wells with biological material. So this is something that's been with us for a, quite a long time. 
and what really scares people is now that we have the ability and capacity to engineer pathogens to make them more more transmissible vaccine resistant antibiotic resistant and there's a willingness to do it so for example the the former soviet union in defiance of the biological weapons convention which they had signed had a extensive clandestine biological weapons program that was offensive that was going to be mounted on missiles that they were going to use to attack other countries and this was only found out basically through um uh, a clandestine lab that had an accident and had an anthrax attack in the 19, an anthrax outbreak in the 1970s in a town called Sverdlovsk, which was covered up by the Soviet Union, eventually discovered by the Americans, and it was something that really got people thinking that this is a major threat that hadn't gone away. And there are many countries that have tried to weaponize biological weapons. Iraq had done it around the time of the first Gulf War. There are there's evidence that ISIS has tried to to have biological weapons. Uh, Al Qaeda has tried to have biological weapons. We had the anthrax attack in 2001 where five people died and 22 people were infected. So this is something that hasn't gone away. That's something that is clearly there. There were reports even in the last year about North Korea buying all these bioreactors for possible biological weapons. So this is a major threat. And you have to remember that biological weapons are very different than traditional or even nuclear weapons because they're much harder to detect. Many of these diseases occur naturally. So how do you decide whether something is a biological attack or a natural infection? How do you detect them coming into ports? There's no, they don't give off a radiation signature the way a nuclear, a nuclear material does. So it's, it's much more different. And people are going to be scared to death of a biological attack. They're going to run from each other just like they would during a pandemic. So this is a real major societal disruption tool. So biological weapons do remain a threat, and I think we're underprepared for them, although we're much more prepared now in 2019 than we were in 2001 when the anthrax attacks occurred. But it is something that's really a core part of our national security, preparing for a biological attack. What do you think we should do to be better prepared? You have to remember that with with biological weapons, that these are infectious diseases that occur naturally. So in general, our assets here are not going to be the military and these traditional things that you think about with warfare. It's actually our, our public health agencies because the experts on anthrax, on botulism, on smallpox, on plague are not in the military per se. Many of them work at, at health departments or at the CDC. So th these agencies need to be properly staffed and funded in order to be able to respond to biological attacks and thought of as national security uh, a part of the national security apparatus. And people get really worried about the, the securitization of public health, but it's important to remember that places like little cities and towns that are going to get, that, that may have a biological attack happen to them, if they're prepared for regular infectious disease outbreaks, they're going to be prepared for biological terrorism. And I do think that that's something that's often overlooked is that, that the, the key link that public health authorities will play in a biological weapons attack. That's one thing. The other thing is making sure that we have vaccines and, and antivirals and antibiotics that are that are stockpiled and ready to be able to go in the case of a, an attack. We do have that that type of capacity with anthrax and some and with smallpox, but probably less so with some of the other agents. And I think it's important to to keep that going. It's now 18 years past the anthrax attack, so many people have forgotten about them. I give lectures to medical students, and they call it an anthrax scare, forgetting that there actually were 22 cases. So I do think that it's important to keep reminding people about the threat of biological weapons and about the need to prepare for uh, biological weapons the way we prepare for for nuclear weapons. Now, as a emergency <clears throat> medicine doctor, have you ever had to respond to any attacks and help contain or treat victims? Well, so there has only there's only been one attack in Say 2001. Yes. I was a medical student at that time. I wasn't old enough to be able to be part of that or if, far enough in my training. And there were only 22 cases in the United yeah. States. I did go to, to Haiti after the earthquake as part of a national disaster uh, medical response with the with the federal government. But that's the closest thing I've been to, to kind of a mass casualty type of thing. And this is something you hope that you don't have to do, but it is something that you have to prepare for at, at all levels uh, in the case that in the event that it occurs. So we don't even really know what that would look like if, if it happened on a greater scale. There's models and simulations, but we do know we can take things like the pandemic in 2009 with H1N1 flu as a kind of a model for what it would be like if hospitals were inundated with cases, but we don't quite know what will happen if there was a wide, widespread attack. I think it would be really calamitous, especially in today's political environment of what would, what would happen and how 
uh, and how the, the what the repercussions would be. We know that hospitals today are running at, at or near capacity everywhere. So any surge of patients would be very, very difficult to handle. And there would be probably mass societal disruption, even with a small attack. Even We know even when someone has a fake attack with, a, with white powder that they bring in, that creates a major disruption. So if it was a real attack where people were dying, where, there were, where the country was at war against something, it would be very, very, uh, I think, challenging. And I think it would really exploit a lot of the weaknesses in our health system. Mm-hmm. Out of curiosity, why are our hospitals at capacity now? Were they not in the past? No, they always have been. I think that it's it's something that we have lots of emergency department overcrowding. If you go into an emergency department, it takes some time to be seen. Hospitals are sometimes busting at the seams. They can't even handle, for example, in the 2017-18 uh, last year's flu season, they were already basically over capacity, having to, to really... Um, struggle to meet the needs of just a severe flu season, seeing people in the parking lot uh, because they couldn't keep them in the emergency department. Lots of that had had happened just with a bad flu season. So I do think that when you had something that was even a scale bigger, you would really have a, a major time coping with that in, in our hospital systems. Do you have any thoughts on on what type of healthcare system you think is would be most beneficial for preventing or treating something like this? I don't think it's a system per se, but I do think it has to be a valuing of emergency preparedness in hospitals. So hospitals don't necessarily think about flu or pandemics or mm-hmm. or bioterrorist attacks the way they think about orthopedic surgery. So I do think it has to be a valuing of the emergency preparedness divisions of hospitals so that they are properly resourced, that there are surge plans and capacity, that they think about these types of activities. And, and we have seen some... Uh, improvement, I would say, since, 2000, to, since 2001, because there are programs where hospitals can get funding to develop these types of plans and, and get more, more ready for this. We saw it with Ebola. Now we've got all of these high, high containment units at, at several hospitals around the country. All of that's getting better. And I think it really has to do with recognizing the special importance of infectious diseases and, and the, the impact that they can have, which I mentioned early in the very beginning uh, when we were talking. And, but it is something that's hard because it's not the same thing. It's not a revenue generator for a hospital to build a, mm-hmm. a biocontainment unit because they may never use it. Yeah. So it's, it's just the whole prevention type of thing, just the reason why some people forego dental insurance because they don't want to pay for it. But it is something that you have to start to think that this is part of business continuity for, for hospitals, that hospitals should be thought of as, as assets if there were a biological attack. So I think it's, it's something that has to be worked out, and we've gotten better at it. But again, I said it's 18 years after anthrax, and things have kind of faded from people's memory mm-hmm. and the commitments and, and, and the commitments and the, um, the pledges to do this type of thing have kind of faded. And I imagine that's difficult because let's say, God forbid, there is an attack, like we don't know where it's going to be. Right. And, and who knows if those hospitals are, you know, which hospitals would you equip or... Yeah, so yeah, there are, yeah, difficult. so people think about the to- top tier cities in the United States mm-hmm. that you think about where, where that would be targets, but you never know. So for example, nobody thought that the first Ebola case diagnosed in the United States would be in Dallas, Texas, but it was. Or that the first right. the first signs of a new flu pandemic in 2009 would be in San Diego, but that's where it was. So th- you you can infectious diseases know no 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 boundaries. And when you're talking about a biological attack, it could appear it could appear anywhere. There are places that are probably higher risk than others. But I think that all hospitals have to have some emergency preparedness planning in place, not just for bioterrorism, but also for infectious disease emergencies, which will kind of all synergize together and make them much more resilient to both. How many people are in your uh, your discipline? of infectious diseases like how many how many doctors well there there are probably over 10,000 infectious disease doctors but not many people work on pandemics many of them are dealing with the the what we would call the day-to-day you know taking care of HIV patients or or working in the hospital seeing patients with resistant infections or working in public health agencies and that type of thing but it's not I think within the field of biosecurity which is what I what I work on or health security I would say there are probably I would say there's maybe about a thousand or so people, oh, wow. but it's it's something that's a new field. It hasn't didn't really exist prior to the late 1990s, so it's kind of in its early early stages. And we're trying to develop a proper network and an understanding of how this field is going to evolve over time. Um, but I think it, it's a great opportunity for people who are interested in it because it is wide open and there are lots of important research questions and policy questions that have to be answered. Mm-hmm. And we do need to have a professional workforce in this field. Are there any emerging infectious diseases that you think are important for people to know about? 
There are. So, for example, right now in Saudi Arabia, there's Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is related to SARS, which we discussed earlier, which likely is spreading from bats to camels. Uh, this is also something that's happening in countries like Saudi, Saudi Arabia and, and Kuwait and, and Qatar. And what's interesting is in, the Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, there, probably, there is some issue whether or not this is getting reported properly, the same, the same kind of pattern as SARS, uh, because that is a very uh, uh, isolated regime when it comes to public health issues. Uh, in general, uh, there are there are diseases like Hendra virus and Nipah virus, which are pretty scary things that also come from bats that have been spread spreading in Malaysia and places like Bangladesh. But they're not something that the general public in the United States needs to worry worry about. But there are things there. We we just saw the explosion of Zika virus in the last couple of years in the Caribbean. That's probably here to stay in this hemisphere, uh, and we don't have a vaccine for Zika, and it is something that can cause really severe fetal abnormalities if a pregnant woman is infected. Mm-hmm. So that's something that will keep our Eye on, and I think that little things pop up here and there that that are always worth knowing about. In the United States, I still think it's the big ones that we're still trying to control. Flu. Now we've got this measles issue that we shouldn't have had, but we do. Uh, there are major cases of hepatitis A spreading across the country, likely fueled by the injection drug use uh, problem that we we've got. Uh, hepatitis C for the same reasons that it's that it is uh, something that's spread through injection drug use. That's there, um, and then. I think those are the those are the ones that come kind of come to mind. We have the threat of antibiotic resistance is always uh, something that people have to think about as well. At what point should the general population start paying attention to certain diseases? Because I feel like there's so many, and like like maybe we were talking about earlier. You know, sometimes the media only uh, I, I, they 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 like to. Um, you use the word alarmist before, you know, and I, I think that's the case as well. Um, so how do we know which ones to actually pay attention to or not? It's hard. And there, there's, there are people that there's kind of these doomsday preppers that prepare mm-hmm. for everything. And I think that, <laughs> I think when things start hitting the general public, when the general press, when you start seeing public health agencies at the CDC or your local health department or at your hospital talking about it, that's when it's time to, to start paying attention. I don't think that unless you're really interested in it, it's not probably necessary to know exactly what's going on with uh, the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo for now. But it is important for public health officials to keep abreast of that and for doctors to keep abreast of it. For the general public, I think really working on the looking, thinking about the things that you're seeing in your community yeah. that you're hearing about, those are what those are what are, what are important. And I think it's a different threshold for someone like me that has to kind of think about everything that's going on. And when stuff happens in other countries, it, 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 it there is a threshold it's going to take before it directly impacts uh, the United States, but it is something that you have to kind of keep keep an eye on. But it's very hard to know exactly what's going to spread and what's going to not spread. Gotcha. So when I see a new headline of a disease, I'll just give you a call. Yeah, and be like, that's, well, lots of people. Amish, do that. is this something I should worry about yet? No. Okay. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you think is important for people to know about what you do or this world? I think that infectious diseases are the most fascinating thing because it really takes up all of my my brain to think about these issues. And there's many different facets to it and many different implications that you don't really think about. And I do think that um, it's really been fun doing infectious disease because it is something that's so intellectually challenging and has this outsized impact. But it's something that we're, we're going to be stuck with as humans on a planet, like I said, dominated by these by these microorganisms. So they aren't going anywhere. So I really think it's important that we are aware of the risks and take the appropriate precautions to be able to to live our lives amidst all of these bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Great. Well, I think that was like such such a really good breakdown of what I know is a really really uh, complex, deep rabbit hole. Um, so, you know, I want to thank you so much for coming on and giving us kind of like an infectious disease 101, mm-hmm. <laughs> as, as we'll say. Um, we'll definitely have to have you back on so we can sure. get more in depth on so uh, any any of these, really, because mm-hmm. I know that you know I look at your blog posts and your your tweets and you have a lot to say. Yeah, sure. Anything. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.